A few years ago, scientists manipulated the DNA of bird flu. They discovered by accident how to make the virus airborne between humans, revealing how a potentially unstoppable global pandemic could be engineered. Their research was made easier in part because the DNA sequence for bird flu had been digitised. So has the DNA sequence for Ebola and they're both accessible on public databases. So is it possible to re-engineer Ebola as an airborne infection or modify the virus so mosquitoes spread it? And just in case you think that's too far-fetched, listen to Dr Michael Crow, the president of Arizona State University, who spoke at a Future of War conference earlier this year. Digital biology would transform conflict, not immediately, but eventually, in ways well beyond anything we've ever experienced as a species because we've never really had, uh, you know, genetic weapons. The biologically based uh, conflicts of the future uh, would be uh, wild by comparison. I'll wipe out your food supply, I'll wipe out your water, I'll wipe out your ability to reproduce, I'll wipe out your ability for your gene line to advance. I'll do this, I'll do this. I mean, I don't know how those kinds of conflicts will be dealt with, but it would be better to sort of confront them now yeah. before they're feasible. But why are concerns about this new generation of biological research now coming to the fore? Partly because of the head-spinning expansion of what's become possible. All living things have DNA, the molecular basis of our individually unique genetic codes. It used to take a lot of time and money and big machines to genetically alter organisms. But now the awesome processing speed and storage power of computers has converged with the ability to turn DNA into bits and bytes and to modify its sequence. The ability to edit life itself, even to then create artificial new life forms in the lab and to mass produce it with diminishing costs. Genetic engineering on a large scale has become suddenly possible with the advent of large computers, where all these component parts, like Lego pieces, are being stored, and then each of their uh, function in a biological context is being explored. So it is possible that entirely novel organisms can be completely synthesized. At least with nuclear weapons, uh, the one thing that kept us safe is that it's uh, very costly to produce them. But when it comes to digital biology, because it's computer-based, uh, then these areas are, are much less costly. We could, uh, in effect, think up properties that we might want, say, a microorganism to have, good properties or bad properties, figure out what genetic sequence you need, create the DNA for that, upload it, boot the thing up, and away you go. So we're at, at the cusp of that revolution. And we could achieve wonderful things for humanity, but terrible things as well. And that raises the whole question about who gets to regulate this, what happens if something goes seriously wrong. And it doesn't take much to imagine how it could go wrong. You know, reality is catching up with science fiction when even the experts are quoting it. It might sound scary, like some sci-fi movie, or if you have just been looking at all these recent novels, divergent series, and so on. Our founders created a system they believed would create lasting peace. They divided society into five factions. A virus could be engineered to attack particular genes, like those of people with red hair, or those with black or white skin, or even to attack human fertility. In the US, the main fear is that there could be an upsurge of eugenics or biological control of reproduction by certain ethnic groups. This is Jason Bourne, toughest target that you've ever tracked. Or really the biggest, scariest alive. GMO on the block failing. might be genetically Justice modified humans. Someone started all of this. And I'm going to find them. The, the Jason Bourne syndrome or the, or the whatever, you know, it would be the modern versions of this. And so Hollywood has done a good job of showing us what some of these outcomes are. And we all pay to go to these movies and they seem really interesting. Okay, well, at some point they'll actually be real. Should there be more oversight of what research is being done? Should some of it be off limits, like working out how to create airborne Ebola? 
for those people I know who work in this field, they are responsible people. They're generally moral people. I think the fear is that it only needs one unscrupulous or mad uh, scientist somewhere in the world, uh, and, and, it, and then we could be in danger. The best protection against that is not more regulation, but more public knowledge, according to those who've opened Australia's first community biohacking lab in Sydney. So Biofoundry is a do-it-yourself biology lab. We aim to engage um, the public with science by lowering the technological and cost barrier to studying molecular biology. So we use this machine to photocopy out DNA, in particular specific genes. It would be, uh, enable you to be able to check for things like whether you have a certain breast cancer gene or uh, whether you're going to go bald, for example. Despite sourcing some equipment from dumpsters, the lab operates under strict government guidelines and does not deal with any dangerous pathogens or human tissue. I think the word hacker has uh, some pretty negative connotations, but biohackers have a really good safety track record. We aim to make science more open source and share our knowledge in a, in a peer learning environment by educating the general public in genes and giving them a good understanding so that if anything did go wrong, we would at least have the tools to be able to fix that. But there's a possibility of hacking by rogue governments or terrorists because most of the cutting edge science is being done online. There are already a lot of controls in places, certain higher levels of containment so that these organisms uh, don't actually leak into the environment or actually kill the researchers themselves. The only problem is we are not sure how secure their own lab notes and uh, data are, where they are stored, and whether hackers can actually get in and see what they are doing. It's early days for this fast developing science, which is why many experts agree it's the perfect time to question if there needs to be greater regulation and cyber security and whether the Biological Weapons Convention is adequate. It bans bioweapons research, but it has little policing or enforcement. Might be time for a new generation of international oversight.